All right, we've reached the half hour mark, so let's get started. Uh, welcome everyone to this week's installment of AMSSM's National Fellow Online Lecture Series. My name is Matt Wise. I'm trained in family medicine and I'm currently one of the uh, sports medicine fellows at the University of Utah. Let's advance the slides. Before we get into our topic for tonight, I wanna to remind everyone of next week's lecture on wrist and hand fractures that will be given by Dr. Heather Gillespie. This dovetails nicely with tonight's subject, upper extremity dislocations and management. Uh, I'm very excited to welcome our speaker, Dr. Jack Spittler. Uh, Dr. Spittler graduated from Georgetown University School of Medicine, after which he completed both residency and fellowship at the University of Colorado. He's now associate professor at the University of Colorado, where he practices both sports medicine and family medicine. In addition, he is the program director for the CU Sports Medicine Fellowship, as well as the chief medical officer for the Colorado Rapids, team doctor for the Denver Nuggets and Colorado Avalanche, and director of Aurora Public Schools Athletics. Uh, we also like to mention the goals of the National Fellow Online Lecture Series, which are to serve as adjunct to your individual programs, edu educational programming, um, to provide fellows with direct access to educational experiences with experienced uh, topic experts who are AMSM members, and sometimes even guest experts uh, in a variety of different formats, and then ultimately to assist in CAQ exam preparation. Um, and lastly, reminders to please mute your device's microphone and turn off your video. Uh, submit questions to the chat function on Zoom. I'll be monitoring that throughout uh, the talk today. And then I will be the one asking the questions during the Q&A session at the end. Um, and then we'll, uh, Andy will be posting a link to complete the evaluation at the end of the lecture. Um, so if, without further ado, uh, welcome Dr. Spittler. Awesome, thanks Matt. I'll share my screen here. All right, go here, all right. You all see that and hear me okay? Okay, great. All right, so we're gonna talk about upper extremity dislocations and management today. And I don't have any disclosures, except for one that uh, there's some pretty gruesome pictures and videos coming. So when I, showed some of this stuff to my wife. This was her face. She's medical, but she's an OT, so she doesn't like this gruesome stuff. That was kind of her face there. But when I show it to our sports medicine fellows, this is more of their reaction. So hopefully you guys are more in the second category, but we'll see. Um, and um, here's the learning objectives for tonight. So just want you guys to understand some basic concepts about evaluating and treating dislocations. And that doesn't just have to be upper extremity. It can be lower extremity or other places. Um, recognize what common sports related upper extremity dislocations can be and, and even some more rare ones. Um, and then we're gonna talk more about the initial management steps on the sideline in the training room. This isn't gonna be downstream effects, whether or not these need surgery, all those things, it's going to be, what do you do on the sideline when you're, you know, covering a high school football game by yourself? And then, you know, when to refer these uh, athletes? Is it emergent? Is it urgent? Is it routine? You know, what things do I need to look for to see, is this an emergent injury? So um, what happens in the initial sideline evaluation? Um, for those that have taken ATLS, um, you understand the ABCDEs. And for those that haven't taken it, I highly recommend it. Um, I work up also at the Winter Park Ski Clinic, which is where most of these pictures and videos uh, are going to come from. And uh, ATLS is really important. Uh, even if you don't see this stuff that frequently and you're not working in urgent care or ERs or you know, a ski clinic, um, the ATLS can be really helpful and make you more comfortable on the sidelines. And so the D and the E in the ATLS evaluation is for disability and exposure. So really looking at the area uh, of interest and trying to, you know, make sure you see the joint above and below, make sure there's no distracting injuries um, and assessing neurovascular status as part of that. And obviously the ABCs come first, but D and E can be really uh, important for uh, risk of limb loss or even, you know, um, life. Um, and, you know, this gets a little tricky in sports medicine. A lot of our athletes have a lot of padding on. So how do you do this in a way, you know, that you can not move a lot of stuff, you can get their pads off, you know, you can have some modesty, you're not completely cutting open, you know, their, their pants on the on the sideline on TV, stuff like that. So those are all considerations you have to think about. 
Luckily, we have a lot of the pop-up tents now on the college and pro sidelines, but if you're at a high school game, you may not have that. So some of those things you have to think about, where are you going to evaluate these athletes? If somebody's down, how emergent is it? Can I get them off to the side? Can I take them to the training room? Do I have to do this on the field? And so all those things you want to you be thinking about. And then again, checking that neurovascular status, because that's going to be the main thing that's going to say this is now uh, an emergency or obviously if there's you know active bleeding or other things like that. But if you don't get a good look, you're trying to look through the padding uh, or the, the clothing, you may miss some of this stuff. So what did you find this? Uh, this was one that we had up at Winter Park. Uh, this was not one of mine, one of my colleagues, but uh, this is a lady that got uh, taken out uh, by another uh, uh, skier and ended up having an open dislocation of the wrist. Uh, so you can see on the x-ray here that the uh, radius and ulna are separate from the carpal bones there. Um, and so this is one where you're like, okay, this is emergent. I need to get this person to a higher level of care. They could have neurovascular injury, risk of limb loss, uh, you, you know, and I'll give you a couple of tips on what you can do. Um, so, you know, first thing is starting emergency transport, starting that process right away. Um, controlling bleeding, obviously, if that's happening, um, using direct pressure. Um, covering the wound with a moist sterile dressing. So if you have some saline and gauze, that can be really helpful. And then, um, you know, trying to reduce this, get this reduced as much as you can. You know, you don't want to be causing significant pain to the athlete, but if you can get that reduced to as anatomic as possible, that's going to help a lot with pain control and potentially neurovascular compromise. And then um, splinting it, you know, because they're going to have to get transported. If you're in a rural setting, that could be a couple hours to get them somewhere. So, the more stable you can make that, the better. Um, so I always carry, you know, Sam Splint with me. You just never know what supplies you're going to have at a game or an event. So I always, you know, bring some Sam Splint material with me that you can use and uh, can be really helpful. And then, um, you know, again, if you're going to be a couple hours out from getting somebody to a higher level of care, if you have access to antibiotics, you can give them a dose of that. Um, a tetanus booster, obviously, but that's not really a, an immediate priority. You can get that done in the ED. Um, and then, you know, um, transporting them, you know, as soon as possible. If you're in a rural place and like we are at, at Winter Park at the ski clinic, um, the nearest hospital is, you know, probably an hour and a half away. That's a, a high level trauma center. And so a lot of these patients, if you're worried about limb loss, I mean, calling for a helicopter, um, you know, can definitely be a consideration. So know what resources you have, where you're covering and make sure you know your EAP. All right, so one of the big questions I always get is, should you reduce this or not reduce this on the sideline? And there's obviously pros and cons with this. You know, the pros are definitely pain relief if you immediately reduce that. Less difficult down the line. You know, you've probably seen those people in the emergency department that have had a shoulder dislocation for six hours and those get really difficult. Um, if they do have neurovascular compromise and something's getting compressed, you can relieve that compression. And then um, you know, it's going to ease the, the the splinting and transport if they're in less pain and, and things are more anatomic. But some of the cons obviously are, you know, if you're not getting x-rays, uh, you know, and this is on the sideline, you may, you know, potentially cause more harm if they also have a fracture. Um, and so maybe you could create a neurovascular injury. You'd probably have to put a lot of force, but it's still possible. Um, and then, you know, maybe you could cause joint damage. And then you just don't have, for medical legal purposes, that radiograph before. So it's not black and white, but we'll talk about maybe some that would be good to reduce and some that wouldn't be. All right. And then just basic important concepts for joint reductions. Um, these are things that I've, a lot of times I've learned the hard way and uh, try to think about before I do every reduction. But, you know, the, the first thing I think about is, is, you know, is this emergent? And if so, starting the emergency action plan and getting getting transport started. Because if you waste 30 minutes or an hour thinking about the reduction and doing all that and then decide, oh man, this person has to go to a higher level of care, uh, you're really gonna uh, you know, delay that clock from starting. If you're not sure, it doesn't hurt to call for emergency transport now. And if you have to cancel that, that's fine. Um, but I would start that process sooner rather than later. Um, getting several sets of hands present. So if you can get athletic trainers, other physicians, people around to help with a reduction, you're going to, um, you're going to be thankful for that. 
uh, getting the splint or sling ready. So whether that's a fracture reduction or a, a dislocation reduction, a lot of times you get so focused on doing the reduction that you forget about what do I have to do after I got to immobilize this. So um, now get get all those supplies ready and, and right at the bedside or by the patient. And then start thinking about, you know, is this maybe going to be a very painful reduction? Is this going to be something like, you know, maybe a hip dislocation or elbow dislocation where they're probably going to need to be sedated and thinking about those next steps of what, what I might need, or maybe I need to do a, a block ahead of time here. And then during the reduction, um, I think one of the common mistakes I see people make is just, you know, if it's a finger dislocation, just trying to pull on the finger and move everything at the same time. Really, if you can stabilize one bone and just move the other bone, that's going to be a lot more successful. So a lot of times stabilizing the proximal uh, part of the, uh, the joint and then moving the distal part of the joint, people are more successful. Um, slow, gradual force is a lot better than quick, jerky movements. And a lot of that too is because of... Um, you can get the muscles to fatigue, especially with like a shoulder dislocation. If you're trying to pull really quick on the shoulder, it's going to be really tough to get that thing reduced and the patient's going to start becoming more anxious. If you put slow, gentle traction on it, it's going to be a lot better for how they're feeling and to get those muscles to fatigue. And then uh, one of the really important things, I learned this from John Hill, who uh, unfortunately retired this past year, but was one of my mentors and, and started our fellowship here at CU. Uh, he called it verbal anesthesia. He did that for a lot of his injections and reductions, but you know, talking to the patient, trying to use a calm voice. If you're really uh, excitable and you know and freaking out, the patient's going to freak out even more. So if you're relaxed, you can talk to him in a calm voice. That can be helpful. You know, you can lean on your athletic trainers, coaches, other people, as long as they're a calming presence. If they're escalating the situation, then I would get them out of there. But if if they're a helpful, helpful influence, you can have them around too. And then after the reduction, um, reminding them not to move it. You know, if you pop their shoulder back in, they might be like, oh man, this feels great and start moving it around. So just remind them that even though it feels better, you don't want them to re-dislocate it. And then um, finally, repeating the neurovascular exam, you know, so doing that before and after and documenting that, you know, it, at a high school football game, again, I'll go back to that example. Um, you may not have a, a system in place for documentation. So think about this. How do you do this? How do you document so that if something were to happen, you can show them that you didn't actually cause neurovascular compromise from a reduction? All right. So now getting into the actual um, meat of the talk here uh, about different dislocations. So we're kind of going to go medially to laterally or, you know, kind of more um, centrally to distally. Uh, from the dislocations here. So kind of start with SC joint, move laterally, and then down the arm to the fingers. So fortunately, or unfortunately at Winter Park, we've seen about all of these dislocations. So I have a lot of, a lot of good pictures and videos. And I have to give credit to uh, Morteza Cody, one of our uh, other faculty and one of the AMSSM board members. Uh, several of these videos and pictures came from him. And so uh, it's kind of a combination of both of what we've seen at Winter Park. All right, so here's the first case. This is a 25-year-old male who's actually um, trying to unload his boat uh, at a, uh, um, a dock, and the boat uh, kind of slipped off, and he caught it and then felt a sudden pop in his chest. Um, he His friend pulled his arm, and he felt it pop back, but it's come in kind of popping in and out since, and it may not be super obvious on there, but you can see that there's some asymmetry and swelling on that right medial portion of the clavicle. Uh, this is a different patient, but this is what this might look like. <laughs> so can voluntarily from an old uh, SC joint injury can sublux that. I'll show that again here. You can see that medial clavicle moving. Fortunately, it's anteriorly. And then, um, and then you want to get some imaging for this patient. So if you do a standard um, AP uh, view, a lot of times the first rib and the first couple of ribs can overlap and you can miss a lot. So this serendipity view is a great uh, thing you can do. You're basically shooting the x-ray up at an angle and then you're getting the clavicles isolated and you're getting the ribs out of the way. Um, and then you can kind of determine, you can see this little diagram here, the clavicle should be pretty even. If it's an anterior dislocation, it's gonna be um, you know, a little bit higher. Uh, and it's going to be a little bit lower if it's a posterior dislocation. So in this case, it, it can be tough to see, and it's pretty subtle, but you can see relative to the sternum, there's a bigger gap here on the right and the left. So there's actually an anterior dislocation of the clavicle here. 
Again, that can be pretty subtle. And maybe if you have slight rotation of the patient, that can be thrown off. So a great way that you can determine whether or not that's uh, actually the case is doing an ultrasound. So um, you can put the ultrasound on here. You can look at the asymptomatic left side in the symptomatic right side, and then you can draw some angles here and you can look across that clavicle. You can see that there's a little, only a tiny gap here with the sternum. But if you look on the right, you can see that there's a pretty big gap with the sternum. So you can see that this clavicle is, is um, displaced anteriorly towards the transducer. And this is an anterior dislocation of the SC joint. Um, and that can be really helpful too, because that can determine, you know, is this anterior or posterior? And obviously posterior is a lot worse. All right, so what do you do um, initially? So obviously confirming whether this is an anterior dislocation can be, can be really helpful because if you're not sure, or if it looks like it's posterior, that's gonna be a true medical emergency because of the mediastinal structures. Um, and if it is anteriorly dislocated um, and it's kind of locked in place, you can try to reduce it. Um, so I'll show you how to do that next. And then, you know, really you don't need advanced imaging unless it's complicated or, you know, you think you have a posterior dislocation. So how do you reduce it? Um, I've never actually had to do this. Most of the ones I've seen have been kind of recurrent subluxations or dislocations, kind of like an AC joint. You're not really going to reduce it and get that to stay in place. A lot of times that happens with the SC joint, but you can attempt to do this. You can put a towel under their scapula to create a little, um, you know, kind of a hump there. And then you can pull traction on their arm. And then you can, if, if that's not going back in place, you can have, actually have somebody put a little bit of posterior force on the medial clavicle there. Um, but again, that may continue to pop in and out. Um, uh, so some pearls with SC joint dislocations, you know, definitely consider that serendipity view. If they think there's a medial clavicle fracture or an SC joint dislocation, you can really get a good view there. Ultrasound's awesome for this. You know, if you have your um, portable ultrasound with you, you can get a lot of information, even if you don't have access to x-rays. Um, and then if you think it's unclear or it's, it could be a posterior dislocation, get them emergently to a higher level of care to get evaluation. And then um, if you are going to put them in a sling and it looks like it's a, you know, a recurrent dislocation or a subluxation, and it's not, you know, not, not a huge deal, and you're going to put them in just in a sling, make sure they start on some range of motion, just like with AC joint injuries. All right, so that's SC joint, pretty rare, but something you don't wanna miss, especially posterior. Um, I'm just gonna really briefly hit on AC joint injuries. This could be a whole other talk. And you know, this is treated a little differently. It's rarely emergent, um, but you wanna look also for associated fractures. So I think it's helpful to get x-rays. And then if you have that type four through type six injury, um, these may need surgery. Again, rarely gonna be emergent, but you're probably gonna want them to see ortho. I've seen type one through five. I've not seen a type six before, um, but the type six, theoretically, you could have some neurovascular compromise with where that clavicle is positioned. So that could be one if they have neurovascular symptoms where it might be an urgent or emergent referral. Um, and then these can really be treated with a sling and then, you know, potentially ortho follow up if it's one of these higher grade injuries. But again, more beyond the scope of this talk. All right. So second case here. Got a 23 year old male um, who comes into the ski clinic and uh, has a foosh injury, not able to move his left arm and has some paresthesias into his fingers. So you can see there's some asymmetry there from right to left. You can't see that there's the arrow there and you have that sulcus sign. So thinking this could be a glenohumeral dislocation. So this is the imaging. You see here, the humeral head is not in place. And then, you know, looks like it's probably an anterior dislocation and, you know, most are anterior, but to confirm that you want to get a second view. So if somebody's got a dislocated shoulder, if anybody's done this before, they're really not going to want to put their arm up in an, to get an axillary view. And if you get a good axillary view, you can definitely tell if it's anterior or posterior, but they're not going to want to move it. So one way you can get a good picture is doing a scapular Y view. So you're really looking right down the plane of the scapula and determining if this is an anterior or posterior dislocation. So the way that they shoot this x-ray is like this. So if it's a right shoulder, you're looking right down the plane of the scapula here. And then if that's an anterior dislocation, it's gonna be medial to the scapula. If it's a posterior dislocation, it's gonna be lateral to the scapula. So this is a great way 
you can figure out where the humeral head is um, and not have to move their arm. So we use this all the time up at Winter Park. Here's a, a video of the reduction. So two people is, is, is best, again, with most of these reductions. So you see somebody's in the back putting some uh, stabilization on the scapula. This person's putting some traction on the front. And then you see it pop back in. All right, we'll show that again. So um, the person in the back um, you know, I think the most important thing is trying to stabilize the scapula so that the glenoid is not rotating. So that person in the back is really grabbing the scapula. The person in the front's putting some counter force there and they're just putting slow, gentle traction. And then eventually it pops back in. So, um, you know, there's a lot of other techniques you can do. This is certainly not the only one you can do, but we found this one very effective up at Winter Park. I'd say 95% of our patients that we do that on, we get a successful reduction within a couple minutes. Um, it's obviously different if you're in the ER and somebody's been out for six hours, but if you're managing this on the sideline, uh, this is a pretty uh, effective method. Here's a different video of that. So you can see the person in the back is really gripping that lateral border of the scapula so it's not rotating. This person is just putting gentle traction that pops in pretty easily. So I'll show that again here. Yeah, you can see that pop back in. So again, the key is not letting both things move at the same time. So if you can get one person to really stabilize the glenoid and one person is just putting traction on the humerus, uh, usually pretty successful. And again, there's a lot of different ways to do that. You know, there's these ancient methods that you can do. Here's Dr. Cody doing, you know, demonstrating the kind of the sheet towel method. There's the Stimson uh, technique. Stimson technique you can do here where if, you know, if you're by yourself or, um, you know, if somebody's really spasmed or tight, you can just hang a weight from their arm and have them lie prone. And eventually those muscles of fatigue and a lot of times it'll reduce itself. Um, you can even do a version of this you know, where you have the patient lying on their back and you kind of put your foot in their axilla and put gentle traction on their um, on their arm. And, you know, that's something you could do potentially on the football sidelines. I know Dr. McCarty, our orthopedic surgeon, does that a lot with our hockey players and football players that are, you know, huge people. And then you can use basically the ground to stabilize the scapula. So there's a lot of different ways to do it. Just get comfortable with a couple different methods. And, um, you know, I think the key is just making sure you're moving one bone at a time. Here's the post-reduction picture. So that sulcus sign is gone and he's a lot happier. And then uh, you can get some post-reduction films. So again, I think documentation is key in these. If you can get post-reduction films and document neurovascular status, that's helpful. And now you can see that humeral head is right in the middle of the scapula where it should be, right on the glenoid. Um, this is one that's slightly different. So you can see that that doesn't have that normal sulcus sign. There's actually a dimple. Um, and this was a, a 74 year old lady that fell while she was skiing and unable to move her arm. And so you look here, that looks a little bit different on the AP view. There's maybe that joint's a little bit distracted, but then you get that scapular Y view and now that humeral head is lateral to the, uh, to the scapula. So this is a posterior dislocation. You can essentially do a similar technique uh, to reduce it, but you may have to um, you know, pull some extra force uh, around to get that, that um, a humeral head around the glenoid. So here's a picture or a video of that reduction. There we go. So you can see, you know, putting more more force here and stabilizing from the front. And then the, the other physician here is putting some gentle traction on the arm and that reduces pretty well. Um, here's the post-reduction films. Again, humeral heads back in place. Um, and then, you know, just some pearls with this. I think um, if you can get x-rays, it's really helpful. If this is somebody that's, you know, dislocated eight times, and you're on the sideline, I think it's reasonable to try to reduce them, um, you know, before you get x-rays. But if you have access to x-rays, you know, a two-minute walk to the training room, it's probably best to do that. But again, kind of use your judgment. You know, if it doesn't look like there's a fracture, I think you can try a couple times. And if it's not successful, then I'd probably get them some imaging or higher level of care. Um, you know, I think it's, I think time is of the essence with this. You know, there's a lot of fancy blocks and other things that you can do, which certainly may be indicated at certain points, but I think 
time is more important. So by the time you give them an oral pain medication or do a block, you probably could have reduced it already and got them out of pain. Um, and so we are, are, what we do at the ski clinic is we bring them straight off the mountain. We set them on the x-ray table. We shoot the films, see if there's a fracture dislocation. If it looks like a standard dislocation, we reduce it on the x-ray table. And then we get post-reduction films while they're still on the x-ray table. So the whole visit takes about 10 or 15 minutes for the patient. And I think that's more important than do a lot of other things. Again, if they've been out for six hours, that's a different scenario. Um, and then I think doing a technique where you're stabilizing the scapula really can be helpful, whatever way that is. Um, and then if it is a difficult reduction, you try a couple of times, it's not going in, they've been out for a while. Um, then I think doing some of the you know, ultrasound guided nerve blocks, you can do, um, you know, a joint injection with or without ultrasound, you know, kind of flood that area with lidocaine and uh, a longer acting anesthetic, um, that can certainly be helpful. And then if you're still not successful, they might need sedation. So consider that as well. All right, Sh that shoulder dislocations, we'll go to the next case a little bit farther down the extremity. So this is an 18 year old, <laughs> unfortunately, these are all males. Uh, you know, that's kind of the theme that we see that these are, these are males that tend to do this. Obviously females still do it too, but the vast majority we see are, uh, are males um, with a lot of these dislocations. Um, uh, so this is an 18 year old male that falls directly onto his right arm while he's skiing and has inability to flex the elbow. You see that there's a deformity here, but not quite sure what's going on and neurovascularly intact. And you get imaging and the distal part of the humerus is now not in place. And so um, this is a, an elbow dislocation. Um, we'll talk about this at the end, but the vast majority of these are posterior dislocations. And when we say posterior, that means the ulna relative to the humerus. So it's a posterior dislocation of the ulna. And then you can imagine if as the humeral head pops out of here, you know, the coronoid process here on the ulna is pretty vulnerable as well as the radial head. So a lot of times you can get associated fractures with this. So that's called the, the terrible triad of the elbow is a dislocation of the elbow and then a coronoid process of the radial head fracture. So you may see that that can be a common board boards question. So remember that for later. And then this is kind of what happens in that case. You can see that that um, humeral, um, the humerus, the, the condyle as it comes out can chip off part of that coronoid. And then you see that piece of the coronoid right there floating. Um, and so that's, that's, uh, that's what can happen a lot of times, but not always. All right. So how do you reduce this? And, you know, this is one you can attempt, uh, to do immediately, um, and try to get it back in place. But from my experience, I've probably had four or five elbow dislocations. I, I have not been successful with any of those without some sedation, unfortunately. So I think it's worth trying immediately. But if you're not successful, they, they just know that they may need um, at least some sort of medication to, to relax them or they may need full sedation. So if you have access um, like, you know, to IV stuff, you can do that. If you only, you know, if, something that could be nice is actually intranasal medication. We use that quite a bit at uh, the ski clinic. Um, some, you know, fentanyl and Versed potentially, so you don't have to put it in an IV. And then um, if you're not successful with that, then go into something like propofol and doing a full sedation uh, might be needed. I'll show you a little bit in the reduction technique of how to do that. But again, trying to stabilize the proximal bone, the humerus, and just move the ulna is going to be the best way to get this thing reduced. But it's going to take a lot of force. So here's a video. These are two of our fellows from last year. This is Joe Nowak, who's in Minnesota now, and Kong Kong, who's starting uh, peds at LSU soon. Oh, kind of froze there. Oh, okay. But basically, uh, this patient has gotten some peripheral fall, maybe not quite enough. He's still talking. <laughs> um, but uh, the nice thing is he, we know he's still protecting his airway, and he's not really totally aware of what's going on. Um, I would I should mention two of these. We have somebody up by the, the head that's monitoring the airway. So... One easy thing with the sedation is getting too worried about the reduction and not having anybody uh, evaluate the airway. But basically, Joe's stabilizing the humerus, and Kong Kong is putting a ton of traction and force on the ulna to try to get the pop around. And it's not super obvious here, but it does pop back in place here. And then you can also check and see if that deformity is gone. That can be a helpful way to tell. But a lot of those elbows, pretty much every time we've had to use propofol for those. Um, so 
uh, afterwards, you know, you can just do some really gentle flexion and extension of the elbow. Um, if there's a mechanical block present, that could be a sign of, of a fracture or, you know, or a displaced piece of bone or cartilage in the joint. So that might require more urgent uh, orthopedic referral. Um, and then this is one where putting in a splint is probably a good idea to keep that stable. Um, but the elbows can get really stiff. So you want to make sure they get in for follow-up pretty soon after to make sure that they can get, get out of a splint as long as there's no associated fracture so they don't get super stiff. All right, so elbow dislocation pearl. So um, looking at the pre and post reduction radiographs for fractures, sometimes you don't see it initially because there's a lot of overlap there. So getting those post reduction films, sometimes I didn't see a fracture initially, and then you can see that radial hydrocoronoid fracture afterwards. So, so definitely get those. Um, again, stabilizing one bone, moving another, and then, um, you know, considering sedation uh, for this patient early on because it's going to be very likely. So if you don't have that capability in the training room, you're going to want to send them to the local ER urgent care. All right, moving a little bit more distally now. Um, I also have downhill mountain biking at the ski clinic, which if anybody has done that or seen that, it's probably more dangerous than skiing. At least with snow, you have some cushion, but when you hit rocks, yeah, it's really bad. Um, and so we see a lot of, a lot of pretty bad injuries uh, up at the, uh, at the ski clinic during the summertime. And then uh, this is a 25 year old male had a foosh injury to his wrist and had some pain and swelling. And this is what the x-rays look like. So you look at the AP view and kind of looking at the carpal bones and something looks a little weird here, but can't quite tell. You can look here, there's maybe something going on with the scaphoid. And then you can see there's a little ulnar uh, styloid fracture there, but it doesn't look too terrible for what you can tell. And then you get the lateral view and you can see that the lunate here is basically sitting by itself and the distal carpal bones are, are all you know off the lunate. So this is a, a lunate dislocation here. Um, how do you reduce this? Unfortunately, I don't have a good video of this one, but it's essentially the same thing you can do if you've ever reduced a Collie's fracture, um, where you're trying to take that dorsal fragment of the radius and, um, and pop it back over. You know, it's the same thing. You're trying to take the, um, the dorsally uh, displaced, uh, um, you know, distal carpal bones and pop them back over the lunate. And so basically you can put some longitudinal traction um, you can have somebody kind of put some traction on the hand, somebody put traction on the elbow, and then you can try to take that, those carpal bones and try to pop them back in place over the lunate. Um, and that's how we were able to successfully reduce this patient. And it actually was not too bad and they didn't have too much discomfort. Um, afterwards here, you get the post-reduction films after they're in the splint and you can see now we can see a much better picture of the scaphoid and the lunate and all of those carpal bones. But when you zoom in, you can actually see that there's a scaphoid waist fracture there. And then now when we look on the lateral view, that looks much better and that lunate's back in place and those carpal bones are back in place. Unfortunately with these, these are pretty unstable and there's the scaphoid fracture. So this, this one actually needed surgical repair. So this is one where you're probably gonna wanna have them see ortho hand um, you know, fairly urgently, not emergently, but fairly urgently because they're probably going to need surgical repair. And so they kind of fixed the, the proximal carpal row here and then uh, put a, a screw here in the, the scaphoid to get that to heal. All right, so what about wrist or carpal dislocation pearls? Um, just kind of like the other joints, putting some longitudinal traction can help, almost reducing it like a Collie's fracture where you can flip that, uh, that segment back in place kind of over the top. And then, you know, getting the pre and post films and looking for associated fractures and then getting them to ortho hand, you know, pretty quickly will be a good idea. And then with any of these things, if you're not getting success, you try two or three times and it's not going back in place, you don't need to be a hero. Um, get them to a higher level of care and get somebody, you know, get a specialist. They may have to go to the OR. There may be another reason um, that there's a blockage there. And so, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to be a hero. You don't have to get all of these reduced if you, you know, try several times. All right, last case here um, is, you know, finger dislocation. Obviously there's multiple joints in the hand you can dislocate, but one we'll see pretty commonly is a finger dislocation. So you have a, um, 
a 51 year old uh, male again um, with left uh, fifth finger trauma. And this is actually four days out. So I've seen a few of these cases where people have had dislocated fingers for several days. Um, and so you may have a little bit different uh, approach than if somebody, you know, just did it on the sideline, but um, you never know what's going to walk into the clinic. Here's the radiographs. So you look at that AP view. Yeah, something's a little off there, but it looks relatively good alignment. Get the oblique view. Okay. Yeah, not too bad there. And then you get the lateral view. And it's pretty obvious when you see the lateral view. So um, this is just a reminder to make sure you always get multiple views. I, this was a, a nice uh, picture that I remember, and it's actually pretty timely with everything going on in the world now. But this is Prince William, two different views of him, <laughs> one holding up three fingers and one that looks like he's flicking people off. So just remember, one view is no views. Uh, get, get multiple views or else you're, you're going to miss stuff. All right, so here's a reduction. Again, Dr. Cody, who's the star of these uh, videos here, and he's doing a reduction. A finger reduction you can do by yourself because it's a lot easier to stabilize the proximal joint and move the distal part. But you can see there that he's stabilizing the proximal phalanx and moving the middle and distal phalanx and popping it over the top. Good. Okay, I'll watch that again here. And you can see also that there's some blood on the finger, and that's from a digital block. So that's something really quick and easy that you can do, especially if this person's been out for four days. This could be pretty painful and there could be, you know, you know, a lot of tense muscles in there. So that can be helpful. If you're if you're just doing it on the sideline, like really quick, they literally just dislocated their finger. It doesn't look like there's a fracture. You can try to reduce that. But um, if you're in the training room or that's been out for a little while, definitely consider a digital block. You feel? And then you can okay. see again here, he's going to stabilize the proximal phalanx and then move the middle phalanx and try to pop it over the top there. So actually increasing the deformity first and then popping it over the top. And it's back in place. How do you feel? All right. Now that deformity is gone, again, you can see the little pokes here from the digital block. And then now that um, film looks a lot better. And you're, you you have that um, that lateral where you know the the uh, the proximal and distal part of the joint are back in alignment. Um, all right. So what do you do with uh, finger dislocations? Uh, you know, what are some of the pearls? Um, most of the time, these are dorsal. If it's obvious that it's dorsal like that, immediate reduction is fine, um, and you're probably not going to cause too much harm. If it looks like there's a ton of bruising you know, uh, more significant deformity, any concern for an open fracture or something like that, then I probably would not reduce it before getting films. Um, and then if you try a couple of times and it's not going back in place, definitely get some imaging and, and get them to a higher level of care potentially. Um, if they have a, you know, a lateral or medial dislocation, that's a lot more concerning and maybe more difficult. Um, and, and those probably are going to need to see ortho and they could have you know, more issues with, um, with ligament and tendon disruption. And then if you have a fracture dislocation, they probably should follow with ortho as well. Um, we showed you the pictures of the reduction or the video or the reduction, you know, um, putting some traction on there. It usually doesn't take a ton of force to do this. And then that digital block can help. And then afterwards, you know, really just buddy taping or um, putting them in a finger splint is, is plenty. So just an overall summary, I know that's a lot of uh, different information I threw at you, but there's some definitely some general themes that can be helpful because in all likelihood, you're probably not going to see all of these things. And you may see them over the course of your career, but, you know, and, and you're not going to see these in, in high volume all the time. Um, you know, this is hundreds and hundreds of patients that have come through our ski clinic over years that we've accumulated these. And, you know, I've only seen a couple of these injuries once or twice. Um, but some important concepts, you know, the ABCDEs, um, taking ATLS, I think is really helpful. If you have the ability to do that, it's, um, just makes you a lot more comfortable on the sidelines. Um, I think time is key for the reduction, um, getting radiographs that they're readily available, but if it's going to be an hour or two to get them to the hospital, I think it's reasonable to try a reduction, especially like glenohumeral joint, uh, finger reduction, elbows, even worth a try, but knowing that you might need um, actual sedation for them. Um, you can consider a blocker sedation for difficult reductions. 
um, absolutely can consider that. But if it's going to delay things 30 minutes, um, I think you may want to consider trying reduction first. Um, just moving one bone at a time, like I've said over and over. And then, um, like I briefly mentioned, don't be a hero. You know, I think everybody, you know, you, you want to be the one that reduces that. You get that satisfaction of that joint clunking back into place and getting them feeling better. But if you try it three or four times and they're in a lot of pain and you're just not able to get it, you know, um, you do the best thing for the patient and, and wait, get extra help, get some pain medications, um, you know, consider a, a block and, um, you know, consider imaging if you haven't gotten it already. And then, um, you know, uh, understanding those ones that you can pretty safely um, uh, uh, reduce on the sidelines and, and which maybe you can't. And we're not talking about lower extremity, but something like a hip dislocation, um, that's really going to require a lot of force and that's going to require sedation. So just, just kind of understanding which ones may be easier than, than others. All right. So we're also going to just go over a couple of CAQ questions, because like Matt said, one of the goals of this is to prepare the fellows for the CAQ. So I'm going to um, read the question and then you guys can put your answers in the chat if you want, and then we'll, we'll talk about the answer. All right. So you're working at a high school wrestling tournament and a 17 year old um, lands on her right shoulder. When she points to her pain, it's near the sternum at the SC joint. You carefully expose the area. And uh, you notice there's asymmetry and swelling over the SC joint and you suspect an SC joint dislocation. Which of the following is true regarding this injury? So basically indirect force and posterior dislocation, uh, direct force and posterior dislocation, indirect force anterior, direct force anterior. So what's the most common mechanism of an SC dislocation? Give you guys about 30 more seconds to think about that. All right, so a lot of people are on the right track there. So you talked about anterior versus posterior, so it's a lot less common to be posterior, but a lot of times this is, uh, let me click through here. There we go, C, so indirect force. So this, you can see by the mechanism, she fell onto her shoulder, but had the SC joint dislocation. So a lot of times it's not a direct force. If it's a direct force, a lot of times, you know, that's gonna actually, would that would actually cause a posterior dislocation because you're getting hit on the clavicle from the front. So car accidents, you know, significant trauma to the chest can can cause that. But a lot of times that takes an incredible amount of force to do that. Um, most often the injury is going to be, you know, you're going to hit the shoulder or somewhere else more laterally, and that's going to cause an indirect force, and that's going to pop the clavicle anteriorly. And luckily, just the way you're made, most of the time that pops out anteriorly rather than posteriorly. And that is, you know, just a protective mechanism to, you know, likely avoid mediastinal um, injury. And so, um, again, you don't want to assume this. Um, there's going to be a lot of swelling in that area. So if you have your ultrasound and you're at the, uh, at, at the you know, wrestling tournament, you can throw it on there and, you know, get a better idea of how, how emergent or urgent this case is. All right. Second question here. You're at a high school football game and see an athlete uh, that injures uh, the elbow. Uh, there's a deformity and you send them to the emergency department for evaluation on radiographs. This reveals a fracture and dislocation of the elbow. What is the combination of injuries that's commonly seen with an elbow dislocation, also known as the terrible triad? Put your answers in the chat there. So remember, you know, anterior versus posterior dislocation and then what can be fractured or what's most likely to be fractured. All right, looks like a lot of you are on the right track again. So again, that posterior dislocation, it's kind of confusing because it looks like the humerus is anterior, but it's really a posterior dislocation of the ulna. Um, the radial head fracture and the coronary process fracture, given the proximity when that humeral head, when the, uh, the humeral condyle, sorry, pops out anteriorly, 
that can chip off the coronoid and possibly the radial head. So correct answer is D. All right, well, um, I think we have, yeah, we have a few minutes for questions. Matt, um, if you have any questions or if there's anything in the chat, I'm happy to, to uh, answer those. And also just another plug um, for anybody that has, uh, you know, I know this is not possible with all fellowships. Um, you know, we're pretty fortunate in Colorado that we're only an hour away from a winter park. But if you have the opportunity to do that, to do a ski rotation, even if it's in the summertime and it's mountain biking, um, it can be an incredibly helpful way to learn uh, because until you get your hands on with some of these uh, reductions, it's really tough to, you know, it, it can be certainly helpful to watch videos and do it, but until you get some hands-on experience, um, you know, it, it's, it's tough to really um, get good at these. And so ski clinics and are a really good way to get high volume in this. And so I really want to thank everybody at Denver Health and especially Dr. Cody for a lot of uh, the videos and pictures in here and all of the patients uh, in these, um, were consented to do, uh, to show the videos and pictures of the reductions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Spiller. I think yeah. I, uh, speak for the audience, uh, when I say that those videos are awesome and, and really added to the talk. So, um, thank you for taking the time to collect them and, and all the work that goes into that. Um, Audience, feel free to uh, enter questions in the chat. Um, I've got a couple to start off with. The first one uh, is, what's your preferable approach for a digital uh, block for the finger dislocations? Uh, yeah, I imagine dorsal side would be better uh, than Palmer, but how do you go about that? Yeah, usually I do. Usually, you know, the dislocation is dorsal, and like you said, it's less painful there. So, you know, kind of, you can either do, a, you know, a digital block on either side, you know, dorsally of the finger, um, or you can kind of do more of a ring block where you're doing it all around the dorsal side. Um, but usually, yeah, kind of quick poke on either side dorsally. Um, usually I'll use a combination of lidocaine and either bupivacaine or ropivacaine, just in case it's a more difficult reduction and, and you can get them some longer lasting pain relief. So I usually kind of use a combination of both and use that, you know, similar for fracture reductions, like a Collie's fracture, something like that. I'll, I'll use a combination of long and short acting anesthetic. Perfect. Um, our next question has to do with uh, the possibility of fractures and dislocations. You know, you brought up how dislocation fractures are things that you don't want to mess with necessarily. Um, how can you tell, like on the sideline, for instance, uh, yeah. that there may be an issue there? And I imagine you're talking about like big fractures, like um, humeral shaft fractures, that type of thing, not necessarily like a bank card, a bony bank card, for instance. Yeah, yeah, correct. Where you're worried about like actual neurovascular injury. So, um, you know, I say if something doesn't look quite right, like it's not just a simple sulcus sign, there's a, there's a bigger deformity present. Um, you're probably going to see some bruising. Um, you know, if you see tenting of the skin, if you're palpating and you're feeling crepitus along that area, those can be some signs of like, okay, there might be something more going on here. And then, you know, just kind of use your, your, your gestalt. Like if you're like this, this is super painful. This just doesn't quite look like a standard, you know, finger dislocation, shoulder dislocation, whatever it is. Um, you know, just wait, get some x-rays, especially if you're at the college or pro level, you're probably going to have x-rays available. Mm -hmm. Take the extra couple minutes to go in there and shoot some x-rays and you're still going to be able to, you know, get them reduced pretty easily. Um, and so, you know, it, it, again, the, the, the tough one comes with, you know, um, youth coverage and high school coverage, because you're not going to have access to that stuff. So um, again, looking at that area, getting it exposed to, if they have long sleeves on, you know, taking the shirt off or cutting it off, you've got to get a good look at the skin. You've got to get good palpation, do that neurovascular exam first, and then, you know, make sure, you know, you're, you're not going to do any harm. And again, we don't, we don't always know. And so you got to do the, your best. If you try once or twice, it's really difficult. They're in excruciating pain. Just stop and, and uh, get some help. Perfect. Like you said earlier, to reduce or not to reduce. Yeah, exactly. It's not black or white all the time, unfortunately. Perfect. Um, next question uh, has to do with the terrible triad. Um, any specific neurovascular compromise you'd expect to see um, uh, in that case? Not usually. I mean, you'd have to have a more, a pretty significant fracture to have, you know, an arterial or venous injury. You certainly could because, you know, that, you know, um, distal humerus is coming, you know, proximally, but um, a lot of times, you know, that would be more with a, like a humeral fracture. So, 
not so much more really more worried about the mechanical block in that case where there's a fracture that could be you know inside the joint that could be you know causing that block and might need more urgent surgery to remove that but again just with any of these um always do a good neurovascular exam because you um you, you may miss something and so testing you know um you can test, you know, radial nerve function, ulnar, median nerve function, and making sure that those are normal after the exam, um, before and after, and pulses. Awesome. Um, another question uh, is uh, about return to play. I know we talked mostly about initial management, but um, for instance, um, for first time dislocations, um, what's the what's the return to play look like for a lot of for a lot of folks? Yeah, that's tough because, you know, a lot of people, you reduce the shoulder, like, all right, put me back in. Um, so I'd say if it's a first time dislocation, I would err on the side of caution um, with something like a shoulder, SC joint, AC, those kind of things. Finger, that might be one where I would, you know, consider letting them go back in with buddy taping or splint. Um, but like a shoulder dislocation first time, I'd probably have them sit out. If it's a recurrent dislocator, um, you know, say they've done this 10 times. They understand the risk. They've had imaging. You know, they've they've, they've had a, had a workup. I think it's reasonable to put them back in under the following conditions. You know, they have full range of motion. They're not having instability, and they have full strength. If they come out and they're like, "Yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine," and they can't resist you, they have you know three plus out of five strength with rotator cuff testing. They're gonna you know either redislocate or they're gonna injure themselves in another way. And so you know, it really has to be full range of motion normal strength before I'm going to put them back in. And obviously if they have any, you know, um, neurovascular symptoms, you know, they're having, you know, persistent numbness in their fingers or weakness in their hand. I'm not going to put them back in either, so, but it's, it, that's a tough one. Yeah. Even for those recurrent dislocators, would you get an x-ray after the game? Um, I, you know, I probably would, if you have it available, uh, just to make sure, um, especially if their symptoms are any different. Um, but you know, if, if you are, if it's say it's their second or third time in that season, you already know they're getting surgery after the season. You've kind of talked with orthopedics and we're like, all right, we're going to get them through the season the best we can. We're going to get them surgery in the off season. That might be a scenario where I might not do it. Um, but especially, um, in those athletes where, um, you know, you're, you are concerned about a uh, further injury and possibly like a glenoid fracture, like you talked about a, a bank guard or a new hill sacks or something like that. I would definitely get some x-rays. I don't think it hurts. That makes sense. Um, and to, to your point earlier about, uh, you know, scarcity of, uh, ski clinic type rotations and fellowship, um, do you have any recommendations for folks who are looking to increase, um, their exposure to that type of clinical environment? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think some things you can do um, are, you know, looking at online resources. Um, actually, Dr. Cody uh, has a book on fracture and dislocation management, um, sports related trauma. Um, there's no, don't worry, there's no financial interest in that. <laughs> but um, educational book uh, that he put out that has hundreds and hundreds of x-rays from the ski clinic. So at least reading about it, even if you're not getting hands-on experience can be helpful. Um, watching videos, um, and, you know, attending lectures like this. And then, you know, if you're, you know, it, um, you know, say you're family medicine or, you know, a peds resident, and you're not working in the ER all the time, you know, see if you could do, um, you know, even some, some ER shifts, um, you know, to, to get some experience with that, you know, you, it might be luck of the draw sometimes, but working in some urgent care ER clinics, you're going to see a higher volume of this than you are in your primary care clinics. So that's definitely one way that you can, uh, you can do that as well. And then, you know, just seeing what opportunities are out there. And if you find that, you know, that there's a, you know, a ski clinic opportunity or something else, um, you know, a martial arts tournament or something where there might be a higher level of, of trauma, you know, talking to your fellowship director and seeing if there's a way that you can make that happen. I, I love those suggestions. Um, rodeo uh, events yeah, are also absolutely. really high yield. Um, and then uh, as far as the, the specific question from, from Josh down at USF, um, I think it's worth just reaching out to, to um, ski clinics. Um, we have a couple ski clinics at Alton Snowbird uh, that we work with here in Utah. I know there are uh, programs that have relationships with Tahoe, some places in the Northeast. And so um, it wouldn't hurt to just reach out to those folks too. 
Yeah. And again, just, you know, um, even in the summertime, you know, I think we traditionally think of these only as ski clinics, but a lot of time there's mountain biking in the summer, especially the downhill mountain biking. And um, it's a great way to see some good pathology. Awesome. All righty. I think those are all of our questions in the chat. Thank you again, Dr. Spiller. This was, yeah. this was awesome. Super high yield. Um, and unless I, anyone else has anything to add, I think uh, we'll call it night. Sounds great. Yeah. And if you guys have questions, um, you know, feel free to email me. I think all my contact info is on the CU uh, uh, Fellowship website. So awesome. All right. Good night, everyone. All right. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Matt. Cool.